So this week's lecture, we're going to take a look at constructive clinical supervision and how it applies in counseling and psychotherapy. When we're speaking about the constructive approach, this is a type of supervision that's focusing on the subjective nature of reality. That being how we add ourselves into what we perceive to be reality and understanding that that at times is not going to be what everyone will perceive because of our uniqueness. Additionally, when it comes to uh, constructive supervisors, they carry a deep appreciation for being able to understand those complex uh, change processes that supervisees will experience, particularly within the dynamic process of clinical supervision. And while there's a constructive supervisor is going to have that understanding that supervisees must change during the process of supervision, but they also recognize that humans inherently resist change. We all do. So constructive supervisors, therefore, are going to work toward looking for uh, providing support to supervisees as they begin to engage with complex change processes that's going to be facilitated by the supervisee in terms of growth and change while also allowing to uh, 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 being able to slow uh, or even stop and revert back to prior ways of being when change is being perceived as happening too fast. Constructive supervisors, they also will look toward and make sure that they comprehend and understand models of their uh, therapist development and use these different models to assist them in understanding the needs of their supervisees as well as developing appropriate interventions when necessary. Developmental approaches to constructive supervision can involve normalizing what supervisees will perceive as demanding challenges to their growth or emphatically joining with them as they struggle to consider what limitations um, they present with of dealing with prior ways of conceptualizing or trying to help them in developing their roles as a therapist now. Also, with constructive supervisors, they're going to work toward facilitating change by trying to foster that supervisee self-reflection through the use of constructivist principles of learning. So with all of this, and understanding development, change as well as learning, it'll help to form this interpretive lens from which the process of supervision uh, can span into from a constructive perspective. And this will help to provide a starting point uh, for that supervisor in terms of considering what interventions would be best suited or best fitted for the supervisee. All right, so now let's start breaking down the process of constructive supervision. So with the constructive approach, now this is really going to be based off of that constructivist uh, idea in terms of how we grow and develop as humans. The knowledge that a uh, supervisor should have and understand would be subjective. It varies uh, because of each person having different perspectives. We often have this need, this inherent need to be able to establish relationships with others. We want to have this connection. So in order for us to do that, we understand that as a supervisor, we need to make sure that supervisees work on their interpersonal relationships as well as their uh, therapeutic relationships with their clients. When we look at change, we know that change is necessary. It's part of our life. It, it, there's no getting around it. In some aspects, change will always happen, but there are going to be issues that would uh, come about that would make change difficult for some to be able to deal with. And so one of the things a supervisor is always looking out for is how to be able to balance these states that would insist in our learning and being able to grow as a clinician. And how do we make sure that not only just the supervisee, but the supervisor doesn't fall out of balance? How do we make sure that that connection stays constant within that particular relationship? 
So <clears throat> within constructive supervision, we look at these type of principles in terms of learning that the most meaningful knowledge is going to be discovered. It's not really going to be imparted from me as the instructor, but you as the uh, supervisee will actually learn a lot through trial and error. Learning is always going to be influenced not only by what uh, you receive now, but your past experiences is always going to help in what you learn in the future. Language is pertinent in terms of how we communicate and gain information through these discoveries, but it's also about that discovery itself, that aha moment that you may have, particularly like when you're working with a client and as you're assessing the client, the information becomes clear as day to you on what interventions will be helpful for that client. It's knowing that you need to know how to convey that kind of information. And of course, we have to deal with our mistakes as well as the anxiety that will build up within us. And that's something that the supervisor has to be able to gauge and understand how to be able to deal with that and, it, and be able to use it within that learning process as you learn how to reflect upon that, uh, those times as well as convey those situations. Because, look, as a young clinician, you definitely, <laughs> and if you don't, I want to know what your secret is you will definitely experience anxiety if you haven't had the opportunity already to sit with your clients that first time is who a bunch of nerves and even when you become more experienced depending on if you are working with someone you've never worked with before then that anxiety can erupt again because you of course as a, a clinician want to know that you are doing the best that you can for your clientele and so we make mistakes. You may find yourself, here's one that I think everybody has done. They inadvertently laugh when they shouldn't. But how do you recoup from that? How do you recover yourself? How do you not allow embarrassment evade you? Those are the type of things that I'm speaking about. Those anxious laughter, that anxious laughter that we may have is just one example of what I'm speaking of in this uh, context. So now we're going to look deeper into supervision in the constructive approach. This is a complex complex <clears throat> process that requires supervisor to be able to perform a lot of different roles that would help to facilitate uh, the development of a supervisee. And now Bernard, who uh, helped to create the discrimination model, he kind of sees it as one of the, and by the way, it is one of the most referenced and most evidence-based model used for clinical supervision. But he kind of sees that supervisors, they could take on at least one of three roles when they're provided supervision that being of a teacher, a counselor, or a consultant. Now, of course, the teacher role is, is extremely evident um, in terms of providing supervision because, of course, supervisors are going to provide instructions of things that they want their uh, supervisees to do. So, of course, the expectation would be that they model appropriate counselor-type behaviors, uh, therapy, beha therapeutic behaviors, be able to provide evaluative type comments on a supervisee's work. And according to Luke and Bernard, the teacher role is used when supervisors believe that a less structural approach will leave the supervisee confused or somehow unable to assess the supervision being provided. And we talked about in previous, I talked about in previous video about uh, when we talked about the client-centered approach and um, <clears throat> supervisee-centered approach, how uh, utilizing that humanistic type of um, consultation and supervision can be detrimental at times if it's not done correctly. But here again, supervisors are acting in a, a, a therapeutic role 
and what they are hoping to do is be able to focus on being able to help a supervisee reflect on internal processes and reactions that's going to help for the experience during sessions that's reflected uh, as by using uh, questions in ways that are going to be consistent with the psychotherapy. So this role pretty much is useful for supervisors when they believe that the internal issues may be interfering or clouding the supervisee's judgment or conceptualizations. So within a consultant role, the supervisor does not provide direct advice or direction here. Rather, they'll encourage supervisees to develop as well as trust their own ideas and intervention strategies and become, become more autonomous. The consultant role, so therefore, is really requiring that supervisees take on more responsibility of their own learning and development. And when the supervisor is acting in the role of a teacher or counselor roles. Now, Bernard, he kind of asserted that the, a successful supervisor will incorporate and balance all three roles during supervision. And the role that the supervisor takes at a given time would be according to how uh, the se session is going to be focused, meaning whether or not it's uh, needing to develop intervention skills, conceptualization skills, or even personalization skills. And that those developmental needs are going to be where the supervisee has to be able to demonstrate and work through. However, despite the fact that with the discrimination model, the emphasis being on these three roles, Bernard and Goodyear, they saw it, uh, within the review of research, they looked deep into the efficacy of the discrimination model. And they said that teacher and counselors have emerged as the most clearly defined and as well as prevalent of the three supervisor roles. Given the dominance of the modernist as well as behaviorist approaches to learning, in the field of counseling on, and as a psychology, the position of the supervisor is that of the expert. And it's not surprising that the teacher role, of course, is gonna receive much more attention from our field. It's also understandable given that clinical supervision really is conducted by therapists, uh, psychotherapists, and that that uh, therapist role would also be highly visible during supervision. More times than not, supervisors are going to utilize the constructs that they develop in, as becoming a clinician, and they'll often go to those when they're going to supervise. But the consultant role really has remained kind of fuzzy in terms of it's less clearly defined as well as understood in clinical supervision. And despite that uh, intuitively appealing, there's still some backlash and some things that has to be worked through. Now, while constructive uh, supervisors can utilize all three roles, the consultant role is going to be the most conducive to be able to facilitate growth and change within the constructive model. So rather than seeking out to uh, provide knowledge to the supervisee as an instructor or teacher, main focus really should be on how to uncover hidden internal processes as a therapist. Um, and so constructive supervisors, they really would act primarily as consultants by providing those conditions under which supervisees actually can identify some issues um, in terms of meaning for them and be able to discover their own answers rather than always looking for the supervisor to have the answer for them. So that consultant role, in a sense, is going to be more consistent with that constructivist ideal regarding the subjective nature of reality, that need for students to be able to discover rather than just receive information. And the main premise will be critical self-reflection in terms of the learning process. So what we do is we'll look at how the constructive supervisor will facilitate supervisee autonomy as well as critical self-reflection in terms of the consultant role. So I'll be able to discuss different ways in which constructive supervisors actually can integrate that 
teacher and therapist role in ways that are more consistent with the constructivist principles. So as I mentioned, this is consistent with the person-centered approach to uh, counseling. And here, supervisors acting in a consultant role must be able to establish close, secure relationships with supervisees by providing unconditional positive regard, empathy, as well as congruence. And with unconditional positive regard, this is established when the constructive supervisor demonstrates trust in the supervisee's abilities to be able to discover their own answers during supervision, as well as provide them with that space for the learning to happen. And at the main part of this process will be the use of the reflective questions that would aid supervisees in being able to focus more deeply on their comprehension and understanding of clients, as well as the client issues. It's their internal reactions to, as well as feelings about their clients. What are their hunches? regarding potential intervention strategies? And how are they able to evaluate the strengths as well as limitations of their approaches that they use based upon their, clinical, their therapeutic orientation? Now there's a book called Supervision Strategies for the First Practicum. And this is by Neufeld. And here Neufeld discusses several different examples of questions that supervisors can ask to help that f do the facilitation of that supervisee self-reflection in several different ways. Now, while that book was used with counseling students, it's actually really good um, in terms of helping students in the first pra their first practicum. It's good throughout. It's not only have to be during the first practicum, of course, it can be throughout uh, providing supervision on any particular level. However, most of these questions have been suggested to uh, be used to facilitate for critical self-reflections and supervisees at any developmental level. So now, one example of how reflective questions can be used to facilitate supervisory development is kind of ask the supervisees to critically reflect upon the questions that they're asked during when they ask their clients during therapy and some of the examples of reflective questions it can help supervisees think more deeply about their questions to their clients and here are some examples of that what was going on for you when you asked that question when we ask that hopefully what it's going to do is stop to make that supervisee pause what were they feeling at the moment the question was asked? Was there any anxiety involved? Did they feel confident in asking the question? You can mirror that and think about your client when, you, when they pose a question to you as the therapist. Kind of get them to start digging into what's making them think the way they are and what's making them feel or feel compelled to ask the question in the first place. Next question would be, what were you hoping to learn from that question? A lot of times, sometimes we'll ask a question and we don't receive the answer and then we just feel stuck like, okay, you didn't give me anything that's helpful to me. However, when you reflect that question back and ask the person, what, was the, what were you expecting? Now a person can delve deeper. The supervisee can delve deeper into saying, well, I was hoping that you can explain so-and-so. I was hoping that you can, you know, shine a light on whether I took the correct approach with my client and so forth. How do you think the client reacted to that question? When you, when, during supervision, a lot of times, Sometimes a supervisee feels stuck because they're like, well, they share what the overall session has been, but sometimes forget to go into some details with the supervisor that would allow the supervisor to be able to get the full gist and understanding of the approach you took, as well as how that approach was received by the client. 
So in being able to say uh, this question, how do you think the, cl the client reacted? Now it's got the supervisee thinking and it allows you to know if you were in the right direction or not. And the same can hold true for the supervisor. Asking myself, how do I think the supervisee reacted to the question I asked them? Were they fully receptive to this information or this question? Or did I notice any kind of apprehension or do I see any type of ambiguity and so forth? And then the next question is, if you could say something different there, what might you say? So if the question wasn't clear and or you didn't get your point across the way you wanted to, this allows that supervisee to get another chance at it, another stab at it, so that they can ensure that the supervisor understood what they were asking. Or in a sense, when you utilize this same question to your client, now the client can really work toward making it clear for you as the therapist. So these are just some questions that would be asked and it's going to be um, asked directly to the supervisee. And a lot of times it's going to be done while watching them within the therapeutic session um, with their clients. Uh, this way, supervisees, they can be asked to be able to reflect upon these questions prior to the supervision session itself. Sometimes we'll throw those things right out to you. You know, you might, we might send an email or something on that to kind of get the wheels turning for the supervisee. And it allows for the supervisee to prepare to be able to discuss these different reflections. It's also important to know that when asking reflective questions, supervisors need to be able to ask questions for which they are genuinely seeking an answer to and understanding to the supervisee's perspectives, which will allow for the supervisees to, you know, to be within their space to critically reflect upon their perspective without feeling hesitant about doing so. All right, so of course you have good questions and then you have questions that can actually be a challenge. And problems can arrive within supervision when the supervisor is trying to teach or provide advice, but they do so by asking a question which is more of a teaching style. And then that teacher educator role, uh, which is like, being referred to as asking known information questions, those will be the type of questions that actually can shut down a super supervision uh, rather than open it up the way it needs to be. So the following is a brief set of examples of the problematic use of questioning with clin in, within clinical supervision. So the supervisor says, well, what do you think the client was trying to communicate to you through this behavior? The supervisee responds, hmm, I don't know. Maybe that she's not happy with her relationship at home. Supervisor, well, maybe, but I think there's more going on here. Can you think of anything else she might be attempting to communicate through her behavior? Supervisee, hmm. I guess I'm not sure, the supervisor. Well, often clients will communicate to, to their therapists in subtle ways or counselors in subtle ways. In this case, I think it's about trying to tell you something about how she is feeling about you and the counselor or therapist client relationship. Did you notice how she looked away when she said she was really pleased with the way her counseling sessions have been going? Supervisee. I could see that she looked away from me when she replied, but I guess I didn't realize what that could have meant. Now, clearly, the supervisor has something that he or she wanted to communicate to the supervisee. But instead, 
rather than simply stating it to the supervisee, he or she kind of attempted to elicit his answer from the supervisee using open-ended questioning. And so in cases like this, the supervisor is aware of the limitations of spoon feeding answers to the supervisee. However, he or she's not yet trusting in the supervisee's abilities to develop her own answers, his or her own answers. So at least not the answers that the supervisor believes should be right. Therefore, the supervisor ends up being caught in this intermediary role, this which is can be referred to as that no man's land, where he or she'll ask known questions in an attempt to elicit an answer that the supervisor wants, um, wanted to tell the supervisee, but felt that they shouldn't have. So this process of asking known information questions, it actually can be really frustrating for both the supervisees as well as the supervisor. Supervisees will often leave these interactions feeling like helpless, like, okay, they are, they're not able to get the gist of what just happened, which can really reduce their level of self-confidence as well as their abilities to reflect on, on sessions during supervision. And mind you, the same can hold true for supervisors. They may also leave um, from their interactions feeling really frustrated as they start to struggle with supervisees' answers to questions correctly. And then they think that, you know, the way they want them to think without actually telling supervisees directly. That's one of the setback and drawbacks that this particular approach can have. Sometimes you have to be direct. It's, it's great to allow a supervisee to grow and allow them to acknowledge and see their information and know what they, that their uh, level of competence is present. But it's also important that you give the uh, supervisee clear, concise instruction. Otherwise, it can be disastrous basically. So instead of asking known information questions, constructive supervisors will seek to draw answers from their supervisees themselves. Now this starts with seeking to be able to understand the supervisees perspectives regarding different elements of case conceptualization, the interventions used, or, or viewpoints <clears throat> that the client may have demonstrated, and that's by using reflective questions. As constructive supervisors, they'll want to elicit the supervisee perspective. They'll help the supervisees in being able to clarify their perspectives as well as connecting these, these uh, perspectives to other such experiences. At the same time, a constructive supervisor will help uh, supervisees explore not only strengths of their perspectives, but the limitations that can be attached um, in order to help them develop new and more advanced ways of thinking. So to be able to illustrate this, let's look at that same uh, scenario from the last slide, but now from a more constructive perspective. So the supervisor now asks, do you think the client was trying to communicate to you through this behavior? Supervisee, maybe. I had not thought about it, uh, thought about it that way before. But she may be trying to tell me something here, the supervisor. What might she be trying to communicate to you, the supervisee? Perhaps that she's not happy with her relationship at home. Supervisor. Okay. What aspect of this relationship might not might she not uh, be happy with? Supervisee. Well, she has mentioned before that she and her husband have not been getting along. This might be her way of sharing with me that she would like to talk more about it during our sessions. Supervisor. Okay. Let's explore this a little further. Why might she have felt uncomfortable or been unable to share this directly with you? 
So as you can see, now these questions are kind of guiding the supervisee. Having the, uh, the supervisee think a little more in depth about how the session went and allow them to process that information in order so that you can be able to gather more for future sessions and know what direction to take. That's what reflective questioning is all about. Now, while self-reflection through the use of the consultant role is at the core of the practice of constructive supervision, constructive supervisors actually can engage in some forms of more direct teaching by providing a limited amount of advice as well as instruction. Thus, teaching must be used sparingly and carefully so not to be able to uh, instill any form of dependency on the supervisor <clears throat> or preventing supervisees to be able to reflect their processes accordingly. The types of advice that are most helpful from the constructive perspective really focuses on instructing supervisees about how to be able to uh, reflect more in their therapeutic process rather than providing them with direct advice on how to do therapy. So an example can be a supervisor uh, might provide the following um, directions on how to be able to integrate reflective practice into the session. If it comes up again, this is the supervisor, I want you to remember what you've come up with now and use it to help guide your interventions. Constructivists recognize though that it's impossible to be able to completely value um, or be judgment free in terms of providing that advice. As therapists themselves, all supervisors, even the most dedicated constructivists among them, will undoubtedly encounter times when it can be uh, become really difficult to resist urges to provide that direct instruction or advice to supervisees on how to proceed with clients. There'll be times um, when answers can be so clear to the supervisor that he or she might feel compelled to just provide that suggestion for supervisees who are unable to develop that answer on their own. And then there's gonna be other times in which supervisors might feel uh, for several different reasons that they have to they'll be rushed to help that supervisee to get them to show that particular outcome with a client. Now, the constructive approach allows supervisors to sparingly provide more active forms of advice about the therapeutic process. If they're holding such insights to themselves, begin to feel problematic. And it can be useful for constructive supervisors who are considering providing direct instructions to supervisees to carefully consider why this more direct approach is needed in the first place. It can be more effective if to, to try to abstain from providing advice that derives from that need to demonstrate competence and superiority, or that this seeks to you know, the, uh, privilege a supervisor's perspectives over those of the supervisee. Now, we're being mindful of one's motivations for being able to provide advice can help supervisors sort out whether this direct instruction really is best for the supervisee at that time. If a supervisor, after carefully reflecting on their rationale, decides to provide direct instruction to the supervisee, then there are ways of doing this that can minimize that detrimental effect on the direct instruction on the supervisee's autonomy, their creativity, as well as their ability to critically self-reflect. So first and foremost, direct advice should only be offered after the supervisee has been able to establish strong abilities to be able to think independently as well as to critically self-reflect. Providing direct advice early on can establish this pattern of dependency rather than allowing that supervisee uh, to become autonomous within the, in, in, in their ability to also reflect. Additionally, it's really important for supervisors to acknowledge that 
perspectives they offer, like any other perspectives, is not going to always be the absolute truth. One of the things I always share, uh, particularly in undergrad courses, is I tell my students, don't just take my word for it. And I think I've said it in some of our other courses, like learning and cognition, I think I've even mentioned it. But you're not supposed to just take the, the word of mine as, as the gospel. Dig deeper. Same holds true when it's coming to supervision. They're considered experts, but doesn't mean that it's all 100%. Now, the third thing would be that advice and direction need to be given with a clear and meaningful rationale. And that's going to be without force or coercion in a way that will provide supervisees choices about how and when to implement it. Then there's the fourth thing, which is framing. And framing the advice is, is a potential experiment for supervisees to be able to try, you, you know, to make it useful in allowing the advice to not be as threatening um, for them. Now, one example of how a supervisor can introduce more active forms of advice would be in a way that's consistent with constructivist principles of learning. And it's like this, quote, the next time the client begins to talk about the loss of a child and you start to feel yourself becoming emotional, I'd like for you to try an experiment. Instead of fighting back your urge to cry, Try allowing yourself to openly feel and express whatever emotions arise within you and just see what happens. Now, here, in the supervisor, instead of providing a direct uh, advice in telling the supervisee that it's okay to cry during a session, the approach was more of encouraging the supervisee to be able to find out for themselves how open of expression of emotion may impact the session itself. Before conducting the experiment, those supervisees should be able to provide space um, in the supervision session to be able to openly and non-judgmentally discuss their reactions to that kind of advice. They should be allowed to uh, include any kind of reservations they would have about it, as well as formulate other hypotheses that might uh, happen should they choose to use the advice. When supervisees do choose to proceed with that kind of experiment, then they could be asked to come into the next supervision ready to be able to talk about those tentative type of results of the experiment that they had and be able to share that with the supervisor. So in that scenario, in regarding providing advice to supervisees, it also gives opportunity to highlight another important limitation of giving direct advice during supervision. Now, in the field of uh, psychotherapy, it could be really complex. And as a result, different perspectives will exist about how the issue, these type of issues in the field, even among within the same theoretical orientation, should it be handled. This issue presented the uh, regard of appropriateness for therapists to cry with their clients. Uh, for example, is something that can be conceptualized very differently depending on which therapist you would ask. Now there's gonna be some that may see crying with their clients as a, a true demonstration of empathy and thus recommends that the supervisees go ahead and cry when they feel that level of emotion during a session. But then you'll have other therapists that feel that crying during a session is really showing very little professionalism. And that can be demonstrated to clients that the issues are worse than they actually thought. If I'm making my therapist cry, this really has to be bad. But overall, the point that I'm trying to say is looking at the issue shouldn't be of a debate about the merits of whether or not to cry during a therapy session. Instead, what this does is raise the issue to be able to highlight some of the aspects of therapy that's gonna be complex 
to be extracted that you're not going to find this within manuals um, or the standard do's and don'ts. It can be predicted that one piece of advice, no matter how appropriate it sounds at the time, will actually be contradictory at some other point and by someone else, or it could be found to be inappropriate under different circumstances. I remember early on when I started supervising, I found myself contradicting my advice during the same supervision session in which I actually stopped and backpedaled because I said something and then as I'm listening to my supervisee, I rethought it and I kind of halted it. And it can happen, okay? <clears throat> the complexity of our, our profession of psychology is not only going to provide strong rationale for supervisors to be generally refraining from uh, giving direct advice whenever possible, but it's also going to point out other important uh, consultant type roles uh, for the constructive supervisor. Helping supervisees sort through what's endless at times of conflict advice as well as perspectives um, that they encounter from different supervisors, different teachers, different colleagues, as well as the literature that they read is all part of this gambit of how in the role of a teacher, a uh, supervisor is supposed to help you to be able to shift through it and work it out. Okay, so constructive supervisors, they may also engage in selective use of the counselor role as a way of assistant supervisees and being able to identify internal issues that might interfere with their work with clients uh, or even their own development as a therapist. So just like with the teacher role, the counselor role is one that the constructive supervisor should use sparingly as well as carefully with their supervisees. There'll be the use of reflective questions like how are you feeling about this client? Or does discussing it, this issue bring anything up for you? And that'll hopefully provide opportunities for supervisees to be able to engage in the process of self-exploration regarding any potential influence or personal of the personal issues of their work with their clients. An effective use of the counselor role can be facilitated when supervisors normalize the process for supervisees by being able to explain to them early on the need for them to be proactive um, with self-exploration, particularly with personalization issues during supervision. Additionally, supervisors should be seeking to encourage supervisees to be able to explore their own issues that might impact the work with their clients and also provide supervisees with feedback that would help to complement the process of self-exploration. An example of this would be like the supervisor could complement the supervisee on engaging in the process of self-exploration like, you know, I appreciate how difficult it is for you to look at yourself in this particular way. Or on the amount of self-knowledge that they can develop through their explorations, like, you seem to have really learned a lot about yourself through this process. Now, while many supervisees will readily engage in this process of self-exploration through the use of reflective questions, others might find it to be a little bit more difficult to relate their own personal issue to their working clients. So it can be really difficult when they perceive themselves as experiencing changes too fast or drastically. And it's these in these times or these particular situations, their defense mechanisms like denial, parallel process, counter-transference can actually cause the supervisee to resist engaging in the client's role during supervision. It's when supervisees become hesitant or even resistant to exploring how these personal issues uh, might manifest within their work with their clients. 
Now, a lot of times what happens is supervisors, they can actually implement suggestions that's providing, you know, from a different uh, perspective, that being the psychodynamic paradigm. And it includes suggestions for being able to balance the counselor role in a way that doesn't really turn supervision into therapy for the supervisee, because that's not what you're here to do either as a, a supervisor. In the terms for the constructive supervisor, what it is, they're utilizing the consultant role to be able to provide conditions under which supervisees will be able to learn critically self-reflection upon what they're doing in the therapy session. And while the teacher and counselor roles are also available when using constructive uh, supervision, constructive supervisors should maintain these other roles sparingly as well as implement them cautiously because we don't want to go back to that form of dependence as we spoke about earlier. So now we're going to take a look at supervisor formats. So formats pretty much focusing on teacher teaching and monitoring um, is one of those supervision uh, formats that's used to be able to instruct and monitor supervisees like with the bug in the ear approach. Now with that particular format, supervisors here is utilizing the wireless microphones, earbuds, um, which allows them to be able to communicate directly with the supervisees during a given session. Live supervision utilizing the bug in the ear technology actually allows supervisors to be able to provide regular instructions to supervisees during their sessions. It kind of complements when it, you know, when it's done correctly. And pretty much corrections when doing things uh, that the supervisor perceives as incorrect. It allows for uh, the supervisor to monitor all aspects of the session. And it can involve intervening in sessions when supervisors feel it's necessary to protect clients or facilitate counseling or therapeutic processes. Now, I'm going to say one thing because I am not in 100% agreement of this myself. Um, because I think at times, depending on how it's delivered, it can actually make things worse. Now, this wasn't a therapy approach, for example. This wasn't done to me in therapy, but it was done to me when I was working um, with a part-time job for Apple. And I was uh, working from home. And, of course, you have supervisors. And, you know, you have supervisors listening in. And I had a client, uh, you know, a customer who I was working with, and they were frustrated, and I was talking them down and de-escalating them, and we were getting along, and I was establishing rapport with this, this customer when, out of the blue, this very brand new, only a week old supervisor decided to jump in and try to take over the call. Well because she felt that I was making errors. Instead of us having a discussion after the fact, she decided she wanted to take it over. Well, needless to say, it was a disaster. Not for myself per se, but <laughs> the customer got pissed, uh, literally. That's what they use. I'm really pissed off right now that you would break into this conversation when I was perfectly fine with the person I'm working with. Now I have to explain myself all over again. It got really bad. So for me, at times it could be, if it's not done correctly, it can be horrendous. Now a second format, in, it really focuses on being able to uh, provide instruction and monitor the supervisee's behavior when the supervisees submit audio and video recordings of their therapy sessions, you know, to their supervisor, so their supervisor can be able to review it outside of normal supervision times. And when supervisors and supervisors meet for supervision, then the session really can involve the supervisor being able to provide written or oral feedback to the supervisees regarding their performance, you know, from that particular tape which can include outlining things that the supervisee, well, and before I even finish my sentence, 
when we're utilizing this is my hope that supervisors are going to first promote the strengths of a supervisee those things that the supervisees did well before going into negative having them look at the things that they need to improve on yes that has to be done but you want to be able to provide tips for assisting them into being able to conceptualize and being able to intervene without it feeling like a weight been thrown on their shoulders okay now these two formats of being able to conduct supervision is largely consistent with more of a behavioralist uh, pedagogy uh, since the main purpose is going to be to monitor supervising behavior as well as the client's welfare and, and, and also to teach you know through reinforcement <laughs> and I say that with emphasis reinforcement by not just going straight to punishment and saying you did this wrong that wrong that wrong but yeah you, you want to hit those strengths first um, through that therapeutic process and it's going to be that allows it to be more consistent with the supervisor's preferred approach now while behaviorist uh, approaches to supervision is extremely useful for being able to convey information from supervisor to supervisee these approaches can also prevent supervisees from actually developing critical thinking skills as well as new ways of being able to conceptualize their work with their clientele so it's important for us to be able to encourage supervisees to become uh, independent and by doing everything for them pointing everything out the supervisee actually could become dependent upon their supervisors for answers instead of being able to conceptualize and come up with answers on their own these behaviorist methods of monitoring and instructing supervisees actually can be inconsistent so therefore goals of constructive supervision actually would prioritize the supervisees autonomy their critical self-reflection as well as their cre creativity and make that the main uh, facilitating uh, process in order to allow a supervisee to grow to be able to change and to improve their professional development now when we talk about formats focusing on autonomy and reflection and creativity instead of just seeking to monitor and instruct supervisees a constructive supervisor is going to really utilize technologies technology in a way that would facilitate the supervisee becoming more autonomous becoming more self-reflective as well as being able to become innovative and grow on their creativity the main point to this process would be the use, use of audio and videotapes during supervision, which has been able to be used extensively throughout our profession. Extensively. I can tell you that's the main thing we use at the clinic is the use of audio tape and at times videotape. Um, it's something that when I was doing supervision, instead of always co-facilitating, steps that I would take would start with especially if I had a young clinician I started with co-facilitation and then I allowed them to move on to doing uh, sessions on their own where they would videotape their sessions and then you know send those to me so that I can discuss things with them of how good I saw them doing and what type of things they can improve upon but it's utilized constantly and this is something that Carl Rogers he found extremely helpful now even th even so rather than supervisees submitting tapes to supervisors for critique and evaluation a constructive supervisor is going to watch these sessions with supervisees to kind of help the process of critical self-reflection and while the use of videotapes is preferable over audio tapes since it allows a supervisee to be able to reflect to their uh, <clears throat> to their therapeutic relationship with their clients and showing nonverbal behavior audio tapes are just as good um, and actually can be more practical and less obtrusive to the client because let's remember clients should be giving consent 
and I know there's been big discussions of this uh, in terms of how this is relayed because particularly you are in a training program you have to present this information to your supervisors but you should always get your client to assent or consent to these actions and at any time they feel uncomfortable then that's something that you have to take into consideration ethically speaking now getting back to <laughs> get off the soapbox that, that, that that's one of my soapbox issues but the more established and widely known method of clinical supervision relies on the supervisor and supervisee being able to mutually view or listen to the supervisee's therapy sessions and to be able to facilitate a supervisee um, to be able to reflect. It's called, it's what we call interpersonal process recall. Okay. Now, interpersonal process recall is really based on that developmental model that asserts that while people need one another, they also need to be. They also tend to become hesitant to get close to people in fear of being controlled by them or becoming dependent upon them or being judged by them negatively. According to Kagan and Kagan in 97, this inherent need to both connect with as well as fear others kind of results in that approach avoidance syndrome. And y'all know the, the, the syndrome where you know, is you have the choice between likes or things you really don't like and you got to make the choice between the two. Okay. And here people continually will approach or and retreat from intimacy with others. And the result of this actually needs to be both connect with as well as avoid meaningful contact with others. So people often will become diplomatic in terms of becoming diplomatic, uh, more or less in different conversations. They will be paying attention as well as reacting only to safe and less intimate type of aspects of the conversation for fear of, you know, the other's emotions or uh, becoming too close to them. Or even though, you know, the more serious or intimate aspects are readily apparent to them, through both verbal as well as nonverbal communications. So people, you know, they wind up getting caught up in this approach avoidance type of communicating. And what happens is it, be, you know, it's like they become a, attacking in their conversation styles in a way of protecting themselves from feeling intimacy. So with the interpersonal process recall, it's really based on the premise that it's only through that process of establishing a safe, intimate relationship that people would learn to trust others enough to be able to disclose those vulnerabilities as well as pay attention to the intimate aspects of their conversation. So interpersonal recall supervision, it's which, you know, it's referring to that recall session. The supervisor is going to strive to provide conditions under which the supervisee will re-experience that therapeutic session, but in a safe and a supportive environment so that they can focus on that deeper meaning that, you know, clients were trying to convey to them. This supervision session then is more focusing exclusively on that supervisee's thoughts as well as their emotions about the session and their client. With the interpersonal recall videotapes of the uh, session, therapeutic session, is going to be viewed between the supervisee as well as the supervisor. However, rather than the supervisor is going to be directing this session by using the segments of the tape to instruct the supervisee or providing an evaluative comment, the supervisor instead acts as an inquirer to assist the supervisee in a better way of understanding the dynamics of the session that, you know, that have gone unnoticed maybe during a session. Supervisees are going to be instructed to stop the tape frequently and then, you know, at any point so that they can believe something important and be able to catch something that's important 
that's happening on the tape and then describe their thoughts and emotions during that time. The supervisor's role then is to listen attentively as well as emphatically to supervisees as they're recalling, or empathetically, excuse me, as they're recalling thoughts, emotions, hunches in regards to the client. That interpersonal dynamic during a session or any other information becomes apparent when watching the tape. The supervisor will act as an inquirer by asking questions that's going to be designed to facilitate more reflection as well as understanding on the part of the supervisee. And these questions can include, how were you feeling about the client during this segment? How do you think the client perceived you during this segment? What do you think he, was, he or she was trying to communicate to you? How did you want the client to perceive you during the session? Do you recall any other thoughts that was going through your mind as this occurred? If you can go back and do it again, what might you do differently and why? Now there's been several studies that proven that the efficacy of interpersonal process recall in facilitating clinical skill development as well as effective sensitivity in supervisees when compared to traditional didactic methods uh, was strong. Interpersonal recall, <clears throat> process recall, is especially useful when trying to deepen that uh, therapist self-awareness in terms of the therapist-client relationship. It also shows being effective with therapists from various skill levels as well as experiences. That being from the beginning beginner trainee and then all the way into paraprofessionals to even seasoned experts. So given this strong emphasis on interpersonal process recall and being able to help supervisees develop their own answers as well as allowing hidden elements of the therapeutic session to be able to emerge. These techniques from interpersonal process recall are highly consistent with the constructive approach in supervision. As a matter of fact, in many ways, it could be considered a core technique that's used by constructive supervisors. But despite this ability of the interpersonal process recall to be able to foster reflective processes in consistent ways, with constructive ideas of growth and, and change, there are some, you know, important limitations of the approach in terms of the constructive perspective. For the one thing, I'm going to shorten this to IPR, it really doesn't allow supervisors to provide real direction or advice or instruction to supervisees. Sorry for that interruption, <laughs> and I might I might be repeating myself here, but there are a number of important limitations uh, that I was saying uh, when we look at that constructive perspective. And the first thing is, IPR really doesn't allow for direction, advice, or instruction to supervisees at any given point. Whereas with the constructive approach, this is providing options that would allow supervisors to be able to kind of deviate from that consultant role without sacrificing the supervisee's autonomy or self-reflecting. Additionally, IPR doesn't recognize the need for supervisors to actively address supervisee resistances in terms of changes using uh, the counselor role. The third thing that we have to consider is that IPR sessions they have to be conducted while watching videotapes, which is not going to always be possible depending on the setting in which a supervisee is working. For example, it might be telehealth that you're doing at this time. And although, you know, depending on which venue you use, you might be able to record it or you might not be able to record it. So, and again, we have to also take in consideration client's 
consent. What if they say no? So those are some limitations and setbacks. And while videotapes are definitely preferred uh, in terms of getting uh, to see everything, constructive supervision can also occur with audio tapes or even without tapes at all, depending on the type of condition, um, again, that may prevent us from using it. Fourth thing we have to look at is IPR, IPR doesn't really advocate for reflective activities to be facilitated uh, by the supervisee in terms of reflection during periods in which supervisees are, be, are frustrated or feel immobilized. So a thing to consider is that the most important limitation for IPR would be that focus of sessions is almost entirely going to be interpersonal dynamics between supervisees and their clients. While there's exploration of these dynamics, it can be a value, it can be truly valuable in helping supervisees develop strong relationships with clients, as well as building on case conceptualization skills. These dynamics, though, can be magnified to the point where they become blown out of proportion or distorted. And this is what Bernhard and Goodyear says as being a perfectly functional relationship becoming, you know, dysfunctional because of overexposure. And this, in all intentions, all persons within the health profession know uh, some shape or form that relationship dynamics are best left underexposed. Now these limitations uh, that's inherent for IPR, they've led researchers such as Cashwell to recommend that IPR be only used within, within conjunction of other uh, supervision approaches rather than recommending it as the only approach. While IPR techniques are going to be central in providing uh, constructive supervisors effective ways to operate within that consultant role, it's especially important to know that exploring relationship dynamics occurs between the supervisee and clients, that the constructive approach would seek to extend IPR in ways that really allow supervisors uh, more flexibility as well as creativity in how to address the needs of the supervisee. Now this can include exploring issues beyond the therapist-client um, relationship uh, dynamic. And, that's, and that occurs by gently pointing out and challenging supervisee defense mechanisms, as well as facilitating structure, structured activities that would help to develop supervisees' creativity and self-reflection during times when they feel it's difficult to develop their own answers. Now, another important difference to talk about in terms of IPR and the constructive approach actually revolves around the role of the therapy uh, theory uh, in terms of supervision. So as a recap, I provided a detailed description of the process of constructive supervision. Constructive supervisors, they seek to help supervisees gain autonomy, self-reflection, as well as creativity, by primarily function as a consultant who will provide conditions under which supervisees are able to discover their own answers. You've also heard about how constructive supervisors engage in teacher as well as counselor roles in ways that would facilitate instead of hamper the reflective process. Also went over and covered how constructive supervisors can review audio and videotapes with supervisees in ways that would help facilitate reflective processing. Additionally, I was able to talk about how constructive supervisors will help supervisees develop as well as critically reflect upon their theoretical orientations by understanding how their predisposed notions of human growth as well as change might impact uh, the ways in which they are viewing their clients' issues 
and help them to develop intervention strategies. So this talks about, and this is wrapping up the end of constructive supervision. And of course, if there's any questions, you are free to contact me and we can always have a face-to-face -face and discuss it further. On that note, uh, this wraps up the lecture for week seven. So this information, I just remembered I didn't provide this at the beginning, so I want to make sure I provide it at the end because ethically I have to be responsible. But this information uh, for this lecture comes from Douglas uh, Rufita uh, in his book, Constructive Clinical Supervision and Counseling and Psychotherapy, published by Rutledge in New York, New York.